Hey everybody, thanks for listening. You are tuning in to the first episode of Stepping from Stone to Stone, a podcast discussing Combat Sea Lot, also known as Pinjock Sea Lot Per Temperon. So thanks for tuning in to our inaugural episode. First, I want to talk a little bit about why a podcast. Um, I'm on the, the line here with Guru uh, Sean Stark, and we wanted to make some information available uh, in a more conversational format. There's been a lot written about Combat Sea Lot, um, s- several DVDs released um, as well, but the conversational format seems to work a little bit better to make... PSP uh, a little bit more accessible. Um, also, a quick note on terms. All during the podcast, I'll be using um, PSP, Combat Sea Lot, and uh, Pinjock Sea Lot per Temperon pretty much interchangeably, although I will probably uh, refer to everything as PSP as much as possible for just reasons of efficiency. Um, I'm your host, Aaron Chappell. I'm just a regular guy, and uh, as I mentioned, with me is Guru Sean Stark, founder and creator of PSP and the official Bob Ross of martial arts. So, hey, Guru, how's it going? Good, thanks. Um, well, so, I mean, that's kind of an inside joke. So, so what do you mean when you say Bob Ross? <laughs> Let me rephrase that. When we talk about Bob Ross, <laughs> what do we mean? So that was uh, that, that is a bit of an inside joke. Um, you're you're a little bit, I guess, laconic might be uh, a word or uh, choleric, maybe. I, I don't know. Um, and you tend to talk in a monotone, Guru. So uh, we've had conversations where, although the the body of the conversation is really interesting, um, the the tone is your grocery list or watching paint dry. Uh, so <laughs> that's why you got the nickname the Bob Ross of that's martial typically, arts. That's typically how I like to beat people up too. Yeah, um, that that was my first experience practicing neck breaks with you. Was the absolute look of boredom on your face as my neck was cranked <laughs> to the <laughs> limit that it should go, and then maybe just a bit past that. But I'm yeah, fine. The yeah. twitches have mostly settled down. So free adjustments. Yeah, <laughs> the amateur chiropractor <laughs> using the Indonesian method. <laughs> so, uh, to start out with, uh, I, I think it's kind of important to set the the background of PSP, uh, and that that obviously starts with you, Guru. So, where did you start out in martial arts? Um, I started out uh, in high school, um, training in Taekwondo, kind of a not not really very steadily, but I, I had a friend who was training, and he kind of got me turned on to it, and and uh, you know attended some classes and stuff like that, but didn't really have the financial capabilities of being a regular attendee to the class. So he just took it upon himself to continue to teach me kind of on the side. It was like good for him to you know get some training time in, and and uh, of course, obviously good for me because I got the experience of um, kicking more than I needed to. <laughs> so a friendly punching bag that hopefully learned something along the way. Yeah. <laughs> so did you studied a, a couple of different martial arts kind of as things went on? or Yeah, I mean, I, I had a base um, in uh, Kung Fu and Tai Chi primarily, and then from there, um, you know, expanded and grew a base uh, foundation in Kali and Arnis and then uh, Silat. Um, but that was, you know, those all of those arts, I probably spent a decade or so in each, um, not congruently, but overlapping. And, uh, and then, um, you know, tons of little exposures here and there that will last a year or two depending on availability and all that so drive time and things of that sort so I mean I went from um, I started in the military doing judo aikido um, not as a blend but those two arts and then um, went um, got out of the military and uh, did um, uh, judo and aikido actually judo rather in 
college again and got introduced to Kung Fu in college and a couple of different versions. Um, the primary system that I was studying was Min Chuan, which is kind of a cotton fist Kung Fu style. It was a blend with some animal stuff. Um, and then the Tai Chi, uh, which was Yang style, and did that um, alongside uh, and got exposure to, you know, Mark Shaolin Jing, Zhao Pai, and Wing Chun, and JKD, and then that introduced me, and the teacher that was introducing me to JKD also introduced me to Hak Kun, which is a Gocho variant from the Philippines, and um, uh, much a much smaller variant, but very reliable. Um, and then... Um, he also introduced me to Mande Muda through the JKD lines, and um, that got me kind of interested in it, but not extremely. I was more interested in the Kali and uh, Screamo. So I pursued that um, with several instructors, um, uh, finishing off in um, Kali with uh, Mike Saoki eventually, but that took a while. So I had done Hawkheim and um, Kali under the Innocento blend uh, for quite a while and then I did some time in modern armies and so on um, to me I, I didn't really you know I didn't have a huge line in that as far as like 10 years under the same teacher primarily it was all under um Dan Malash was kind of my teacher in Hokkun and um, Macaulay, and so whatever other opportunities I would get, I would just kind of push it all together into one thing. Because I didn't really see it as being all that different, to be honest, as more just emphases. Um, and then um, started doing the sea lot with. Um, um, Bruno Kruiki, uh, who introduced me to Stolak, he was interested in the, the Kuntal I was doing, which is the Hakun. And uh, so we began um, training each other. I started training him in Hakun, and he started training me in Roger Stolak and Garote Lorenza. So I did that um, for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, something like that with him. Up until about 2004 or five, I think, was probably the last time that I trained with him directly. And then um, he introduced me to Rudy Varana Takasuma of Jati Vasesa, and um, I did a little bit of material with them, and uh, um, ultimately ended up going to Indonesia and training with his brother, um, Guru Ravi Malana. And um, Abek, I don't actually know his full name, um, but uh, trained with them in, in Jati Wasesa and um, had been doing Pomor as well. I got introduced to um, my Pomor teacher by Bruno. And yeah, so it's all kind of overlapping. There's a lot of um, years and years of training and training in multiple arts at the same time. Typically, you know, I would say on average three to four arts simultaneously. Um, you know, staying up till midnight training and going to work and doing it again the next day. So that's kind of what I did um, and uh, found a real home in certain ways in Pomor and uh, really enjoyed Sturlock and the Kuntal and and the Kali and Jati Vasesa, but I, I didn't have enough regular access to Jati Vasesa to really progress in that. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. Apparently, you can get a lot done if you limit TV time. So, yeah, yeah. If you, I mean, if you want to do it, you can you can do a lot of things. Um, you know, I spent about a year and a half, maybe something like that, with uh, Park Vic doing Sarah. And uh, also, while I was doing the Pomor and everything else, so yeah, it's it's possible. Uh, and you know, the reality is, when you do that, you start to see 
so much cross pollination and so much relationship between the different things that it's um, there's two sides to it. One side is that you see how things cross pollinate and how they're not so different, and then the other side of it is what does differentiate them sometimes gets mushy when you're doing too much at the same time. So it's it was a little bit of a catch twenty two. Hmm. So you, you did several different arts. Was there something specific that you were looking for, or was it just, hey, this is the next cool thing around the corner? No, I mean, I, I grew up um, kind of fighting and, and spent a lot of time um, doing a lot of playground fighting, you know, when I was younger and uh, at school and in the streets. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I was like, any kind of a professional fighter or anything like that. I was just kind of a unguided kid, and during that you know that portion of my life, that's what I did. You know, volunteer to fight people and just for the hell of it. And uh, people who were much older or whatever. And some of it, I think, was you know trying to fit in and gain credibility and all that. But in the process, what I learned is that sometimes when you get your ass kicked. Uh, you kind of need to figure out what what you're doing wrong. It's not just keep fighting, because um, that's not a lot of fun when you're, oh, I, guess what, I can't see out of either of my eyes for the next um, three hours because they're completely swollen shut. So, you know, there were some moments where you kind of go, all right, what is, what is all this about? And um, I continue to kind of experiment with all of that throughout <clears throat> the training, you know. And uh, when I was started off in in the judo and aikido you know i was like that's cool i just couldn't quite see it so much as a martial art no offense to anybody but it was a lot of fun and it was a lot of culture and i enjoyed it and i still use it um but i use it in a different context than it was presented and uh, then i also you know was doing kung fu like i said and was animal systems you know where you're trying to um, mimic a crane or mimic a monkey or mimic a tiger or mimic a snake or whatever. And uh, it was such an exaggeration of combativeness that it it just really didn't work when it came down to it. <clears throat> Not that components of it didn't work. I still use some of you know, the material. <clears throat> but I... But the exaggeration of it, uh, I found to be culturally interesting, but not necessarily our culture, right? Like, uh, people in the U.S., you know, will just basically tackle your ass if you're being an idiot, or they'll punch you, uh, you know, from the overhand hook or whatever, you know what I mean? There's not a lot of, like, wait, I'm getting into crane posture. So... <laughs> Um, you know, so it was kind of that constant, like, checking, does this actually work? Does this not actually work? And so in that process, you know, of studying, I, at one point had relocated and started in a Shaolin uh, school, um, which was Longfest. And um, I enjoyed the school to some extent, but I, I actually did not end up staying there very long uh, because I... Shortly after starting, um, they, on a regular basis, they would have this fight night, and uh, I got introduced to um, Hugo, which is his nickname, um, and Hugo would go there on fight night, which was an open fight night, anybody could come to it, and he would basically just run the mat. Um, he's kind of a bigger guy, and kind of just... Uh, at the time he was training six to eight hours a day and it was basically his livelihood he was trying to teach and run a school and all that and um, so he he was fairly good at it you know I'll never give him that much credit because he, <laughs> he'll be listening yeah he'll eventually hear this and then I'll have to you know put up with that so um, you know we he came and he I remember him calling me out and being like, I want to fight you, you know, and, and 
if you know Hugo, you know that that's not even remotely difficult to imagine. <laughs> so um, it's kind of hard he, not to imagine that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so <laughs> he called me out, and you know, I ended up fighting him, and and like I threw a hit on him, you know, and we threw hits on each other, and he realized that I I don't mind banging, and um, and kind of. Uh, we became fast friends at that point, you know, like immediately after the class we went out and we uh, went out to eat and um, had coffee and just basically yapped for about three hours over martial arts, you know, and um, and he was in many ways kind of the antithesis of my thought pattern, but, you know, the more I got to know him, the more we banged together and trained, you know, the more analysis we would do uh, with each other about the materials we were studying. And um, I realized that we're really talking about the same stuff just from different perspectives. And um, so we ended up, uh, to this day, uh, you know, I consider him my best friend. And uh, he um, he is kind of my sounding board when I was going through these materials trying to find things, you know, like that actually work and you apply them to somebody who's essentially like training with a deficit, you know, like, oh, why don't you just tie one arm behind your back? That would be the kind of the equivalent of fighting Hugo. <laughs> and so um, that's what I was doing, you know, that, and I would like, yeah, fuck the tiger. The tiger's not working. Uh, the crane's not really working. And, you know, and so I started you know, chipping away and, and looking at what was functional and what I always came down to was sort of this simplistic component. You know, what was simple is what I did because everything else, uh, the complexity of it made it improbable and impractical for um, combative stuff, especially with the deficit of uh, working with somebody, uh, working against somebody who's not unwilling to go Mike Tyson on you, he'll bite you or whatever. And um, very aggressive and very large. So it, that was kind of my process through all those different things is um, trying to find solutions for um, things that I, uh, you know, you can have a class period where you, you know, you could do the best um, drills in the world with the most aggression and all that stuff, but it was still a drill, right? And until you had somebody break it or actually not care about the drill, uh, that's when you realize that, oh, this doesn't actually work so well. Um, and so that's kind of what Hugo was for me. Yeah, I'm trying to remember, I, I think I first met Hugo, um, like you and I have talked about him before in 2004 or 2005, Yeah, I want to say. Was that the one in, in Iowa or, or yeah. Kansas City? I went to both, I think. Uh, no, I went to the one in Kansas City. I didn't go to the one in Iowa. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, if I remember correctly, I, I got fish hooked and eye gouged <laughs> and farted on <laughs> and bitten and I think I got oh, eye gouged okay. again. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that, that, that's a, a quick interjection I want to make. As we mentioned earlier, Guru Stark is a little bit um, laconic or understated sometimes. You're how tall, Guru? Uh, about six one. Okay, so about six one, and probably you know, d depending on on how well the the food's been, what about two forty, two fifty, maybe. Um, no, actually, I'm a much trimmer, more beautiful me. <laughs> I, um, I'm running right now at about two ten, two twelve, but I do a lot more lifting and stuff now. So. Oh well, I didn't notice you hitting any less hard last time, so <laughs> maybe, maybe my vision was just kind of slowing. But Hugo. Yeah. When I met him, was was closer to his fighting weight at about two eighty and about uh, about six foot seven in his uh, sock feet. Yeah. So when you say a little bit larger, you're you already sort of have a body type that's um, outside the parameters of most of the the Southeast Asians that I've met, and yeah. Hugo sure. has one that is far outside of most normal parameters of you know tribes that are not Viking. Um, <laughs> or <laughs> jumping off a dragon ship to raid somebody and burn your village down. So, um, yeah, that sounds accurate. He's an interesting experience, uh, and I think that's my understatement for the the podcast. Yeah. Uh, so, um, 
you know, you, you talked a little bit about meeting him, and then I, I guess you, um, I, I don't remember if you mentioned uh, you continued training with Hugo and uh, doing a little bit of unchoreographed work or uh, breaking drills or just beating the crap out of each other. How would you like to put that? Well, I mean, most of the time we would just get together and fight. I mean, we didn't use any gear or anything like that. So for the most part, we would, um, you know, we f we fought each other. We hit each other, kicked each other. Um, we both had some pretty... Mm, I have permanent injuries from Hugo, and he, I'm, I don't know where he's at, but I know that I have taken him out of his work role for a while. So, I, I mean, we we got to a place where we, you know, after a decade or so of doing that to each other on a regular basis, you know, we would get together, we would fight, and then we would spend a few hours, you know, three, four hours kind of talking about it and talking about our progress in martial arts. You know, we weren't, we weren't training together as such um, until much later. Um, he was doing his shoreiru and um, whatever else, and I was doing my stuff at the time, probably mostly Kuntao and Tai Chi and Kali and Sitsun Sila at that point. And, um, yeah, so we just really, you know, we would basically get together, beat the snot out of each other, <clears throat> and... Um, try to kind of analyze it and go through it and sort through it and ask bigger questions, you know, like, you know, how many freaking relationships can there actually be, you know, isn't it? It seems like with two hands and two feet, there can only be so many combinations, you know. I remember at one point, I don't, I don't remember what the number is, but I remember Hugo going back at some point uh, and coming to me and saying, yeah, I figured it out one time, and there's like, whatever, you know, fucking 3,000 combinations or whatever it could be. I mean, it was an insane amount, so we're like, okay, well, that's not the solution then. And, um, <laughs> that, that's know, the thing that surprises yeah. you about Hugo. Yeah, he's incredibly intelligent, um, super, super smart guy, but uh, he doesn't have any problem beating the hell out of me and going Neanderthal, too. So. He, he seems very comfortable in that role, and I've, I've as somebody who got suckered into oh, a big dumb caveman, uh, when I first met Hugo, that is really not the case. Not um, even close. <laughs> yeah. When you find out there's a first-rate intellect running the big dumb caveman, it's a fairly terrifying combination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I mean, we did some training. We would do some scenario stuff. Um, uh, in particular, with guns and knife, um, you know, Hugo always told me that, you know, knives scared the hell out of him, you know, all that stuff. And so we, we did a lot of that as well. Um, just to, you know, was practice with starter pistols, loaded starter pistols and stuff like that. So I mean, we've done the days of airsoft. Yeah, I yeah. mean, in a way, right? But, you know, obviously still not packing the load, I guess. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, we did, we did some of that kind of training, you know, more than, I mean, a lot of stupid injuries. Um, he's the only guy that I ever fought, well... Yeah, I think so. He's actually the only guy I think I ever fought in an actual martial arts competition. And um, I fractured his arm during the competition, but he still beat me. <laughs> I didn't point his little bastard. <laughs> and my little little. Yeah. Um, but uh, he encouraged me to go because he wanted me to, to fight. So we went, and yeah, it was, it was like my last one, but... Um, yeah, so we did all kinds of stuff together, but I mean, it mostly, you know, no, I say no holds barred, but, you know, that's, you know, we weren't retarded about it. Like, if, obviously, if my groin is going to be completely open, he wouldn't blast me. Now, that doesn't mean he wouldn't kick me. <laughs> He'd totally kick you, right? But he wouldn't necessarily blast you. Where it became... You know, like, oh, like, you know, I remember one time I was throwing these back elbows at him, and, and I, it was, it was just ridiculous, right? I threw three in a row, alternating left, right, left, right. Um, and I remember literally thinking, my teacher saying, uh, never do three of the same thing, because they'll figure out what the hell you're doing, blah, 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 right? Well, right about that time, 
my vision went completely white. Not black, completely white. And then eventually I kind of just peeled away and kind of ran off, putting my hands up because I didn't know what the hell I was going to get hit with next. <laughs> and then my vision went black. And then I continued to walk away, went down and uh, looked in the bathroom. And by the time I got to the bathroom to see what the hell had happened to my face, basically both my eyes were black and um, my uh, eyes were swelling shut. And basically at that time, you know, I did a number on my eye socket and partially detached my retina just with one punch. So... It was not a good moment, but it was memorable. That whole three things in a row thing really stuck with me. <laughs> well, and there's the Hugo takeaway from that, which uh, the first time he was hitting me fairly hard, um, you know, I was hurting pretty bad, as that tends to happen. Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, well, I just want you to remember one thing. Fortunately, this isn't hurting me at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Sounds about right. So yeah, I'm over here getting fucking murdered, and he was like, "Well, I just, you know, just as long as you know that I'm comfortable, that's fine." <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so out of the backyard sessions with Hugo uh, from previous talks, you you, you started to kind of organize things and um, put things into relationship when it came to what would eventually be PSP. Yeah, I mean, really. Um, the organization methodology, and I, I was studying for more, as I said, and I was about three years in or four years in, something like that, three years maybe, of studying for more, and I just, I had, I really just, I had an epiphany. I literally just, that moment where shit just comes together, you know. We have been asking all the same questions over and over and over, not coming up with any answers, and when I say over and over, I mean for years and thumping each other and not really having solutions and literally I, I had a, an epiphany about um, some of those questions which is like how do you come up with a combination of uh, materials that would address most everything but without being you know 3,000 techniques long and um and so on, and it literally PSP, you know, not as it stands today, but PSP at its core came together in about two weeks' time. Um, from the moment I had the epiphany and just sort of like processing what it all meant and putting it, it together, it really was only a couple of weeks. And uh, since then, I've continued to learn from it and about it and continue to refining and most of that refining has been reduction well and that's something I, I think we'll probably have to save for next time but Sorry. there's a, a few things from the worms eye view I think we, I've called it in the past um, that are fairly unique uh, in, in PSP one of those is a, a constant urge rather than to grow or bloat the system but to pare it down to yeah just absolute basics here's how you grow your attributes here's how you express them yeah and yeah i mean doing that for me was a process uh it took me a long time to figure that out i mean um but it was really about the looking at you know from doing all having exposure to all these systems right you get to a place where you have to you have to somehow put that information in your head in a way that makes sense um, to you because there's so much different stuff right and what I what I found is that yeah there's a lot of different stuff like what Pumora emphasizes and what Jonti Wasesa emphasizes and what Shorey Ru does and, and so on and so on um, is it, it are the things that make them unique and stand alone but when you take away those things what make them all formidable are the things that are all pretty pretty much the same things. And so that's kind of what I started to try to find is like, what are all the same things in all of these arts? And what are the things that I can find that have application from empty hand to weapons and so on? And, 
and without all the bloat. So that's kind of where my approach was in putting things together and redemption, I guess. Well, it's more or less been where it's beat where it's been from the time I've been associated with the system, off and on for well, more often on for thirteen years now. Yeah. So no, I think that's a, a good place to put a pin in it. Uh, for everybody who's listening, one of the things that we are trying to do is keep these relatively short. So, you know, I, for instance, I drive all day, and uh, not everybody has that opportunity. So, um, you know, if you've got 30 minutes, you can sit down and listen to one of these versus having to spend several hours uh, on them. So, thanks everybody for listening. Guru, do you want to say anything to close out? Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy doing this. I hope that uh, it helps people understand perspective of uh, PSP, and you know, hopefully we can continue to keep up on them. And um, obviously, check out um, the Facebook pages and the website and all that YouTube channel um, because when you're hearing these things, it will make sense also to see some of it and uh, have some context for it. Well, absolutely, and when we get to be fancy professional podcasters so we'll probably start dropping links all over the place and uh, embedding things alongside you know, where you'll find these audio files. So hopefully that comes sooner rather than later, but until then folks, we'll uh, see you next time. <laughs>